Hello, welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast series. I'm your host and interviewer each week, Scott Miller. What an honor to have you joining us again for our 200th plus episode, three and a half years now as the host of what has become the world's largest and most influential weekly leadership podcast, interviewing luminaries from all walks of life, whether it be Doris Kearns Goodwin, Matthew McConaughey, uh, uh, Seth Godin, Dan Pink, Liz Wiseman, Eric Barker. We've been so appreciative of your support and uh, 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 pollination of our podcast. Today's guest will not disappoint we have the author of 15 best-selling books, a cultural icon. She is, of course, the founder of the Huffington Post and the CEO and founder of Thrive Global. Today, in the house, is Ariana Huffington. Welcome to On Leadership. Thank you so much, Scott. It's great to be with you. I love the podcast. I love the guests you pick, and I'm really looking forward to this. Ariana, what, a, what an honor to have you today. Thank you for pouring in to all of our listeners and viewers your insight. You have uh, been a cultural icon for decades, whether it be as a you know, political strategist or as a candidate, as an author, as a keynote speaker, as an entrepreneur, as a spouse, as a mother, as a shepherd to the world's community on helping to right-size our priorities. You, know, you have done a tremendous amount of goodwill, being a model of helping us understand our values, our priorities. And we'll talk today a little bit about some of the transformation that you've been on as well. Let's start first with the conversation around what is Thrive Global? For, for hundreds of millions of people, they know you, of course, as the icon, perhaps the celebrity, as the author, the person who invented and created the Huffington Post. And then you had a bit of a health scare and you did a fairly significant pivot in your life several years ago while you founded Thrive Global. Talk a bit about what that big pivot was and how that came about for you. So thank you, Scott. The, the pivot was in 2007, two years into building the Huffington Post. I was the divorced mother of two daughters. And uh, I had really bought into the collective delusion that in order to succeed, to be a great founder and a great mom, I had to power through exhaustion. I didn't have the luxury of taking care of myself. And as a result, I literally collapsed from burnout, sleep deprivation, hit my head on my desk, broke my cheekbone. And that was the beginning of my realizing through a lot of study and research that burnout was not just my personal diagnosis, but a global epidemic. So at first, I started covering these issues exhaustively uh, on the Huffington Post. We launched in 2007 the first dedicated sleep section and uh, wrote two books on the subject, Thrive, The Sleep Revolution. But by 2016, uh, nine years later, I felt that I wanted to do more. I didn't want just to raise awareness. I wanted to help people go from awareness to action. So I left HuffPost to build Thrive Global as a behavior change technology company that works with uh, enterprises around the world to help their employees adopt healthier habits and um, see through data that we are collecting the connection between the well-being and mental resilience of employees and business metrics like attrition, retention, productivity, healthcare costs. So bring more rigor into the wellness conversation so that it's not just seen as warm and fuzzy benefits, but central to the success of the enterprise. And Ariana, we'll get into that, uh, that topic around sleep and life balance here in our conversation. First, I'd like to talk about the fact that you have a multifaceted brand over you know, many decades, right? You were, of course, a spouse to a, a U.S., I believe, congressman. You are the, you're a mother. You are an icon in the literary world. You are an entrepreneur. You are a CEO. As someone who's in the public eye, how do you decide how to manage the public perception of your passions, perhaps things that you were maybe passionate about earlier in your career, and for whatever reason, you've left those behind and you're moving on. Do you spend time thinking about where you've been and where you're going and how you manage the perception of you? Maybe kind of be vulnerable and talk about 
To what extent does that cross your mind? You know, one of the great things that has happened, uh, Adam Grant is great on that, is to realize that if we are going to evolve through our lives, um, we need to acknowledge that we are going to change, that our beliefs may change, what we prioritize may change, our passions may change. Adam has written a whole book about it called Think Again. And I feel that um, the only kind of priority for me is to be authentic to myself. And when um, how we work and live became a big priority for me, I wanted to honor that. And that meant moving away from media, which had been my priority for decades, and launching a new company, learning a lot of new things, which of course is the way we, we stay curious and vital and um, starting again. And, you know, there are never guarantees when you start a company. I mean, we've been very lucky and we just closed a great Series C with Kleiner Perkins leading at a great valuation. But there are no guarantees. When I left a global media company with hundreds of employees around the world to start again, it was because that's what my heart and my soul wanted to do. That's what I felt um, was the area where I could make the greatest contribution, but without any guarantees. Dig a little bit deeper on that. For the listener and viewer who's watching you from around the world right now, whose values and their own personal brand might be evolving, any advice you would give them on how they manage the perceptions others might have of them. For example, for you, right? Your brand, your priorities, your values have evolved over the year. You live your life, like it or not, in the public eye. You are as a celebrity CEO. Is there any advice you would give the normal person like me whose values and brand are evolving and others may have a perception of us, how we manage where we're headed with what other people might be stuck in terms of their perception about us? Well, first of all, you know, um, if we live our lives too much looking over our shoulders at what other people are thinking of us, then we don't have enough energy to move forward. So I think that's always a danger. You know, one of the great things about getting older, Scott, is that you spend less energy and time looking for people's approval. Amen to that. And, and more energy and time looking at what is it that brings you alive. And when, when, we are, when we come to life because we are doing what we love, first of all, it doesn't feel like work. And second, that's when we are most creative, our mm -hmm. most productive. That's when we have the biggest impact on the world. And so obviously we need to be realistic. You know, um, if somebody has to make a living as most of us do, and support a family, then we need to navigate the world of those practical needs with the world of our own passions and desires. Um, I'm not saying abandon whatever you are doing and start again if you can't pay the rent. You know, why do you think there's such a gap between how we define success in life, relationships and purpose and meaning and legacy, and our own behaviors in terms of, in the Western world, how much we work. Talk about that struggle and what insight or maybe motivation would you give us on how we align our behaviors with really what we know matters in life but we don't always act on? Well, that's what is so great about this great resignation that at Thrive we call the great reevaluation. Um, the pandemic has been an incredible um, crucible of pain and grief and anxiety and uncertainty, but also an opportunity to redefine, like we haven't been able to do for generations, what we value. And um, that's part of the great resignation. A lot of people are looking at their lives and their work. And while in the past, the assumption was you get on the career train and you keep climbing, now, people are looking and, and um, seeing what do they really value in their lives and what brings them joy and what's the greatest contribution they can make. I mean, that's what Thrive 
my book is about and Thrive the Company in many ways, you know. Um, in the book, I write how, uh, unfortunately, um, in modern societies, we tend to define success in very shallow ways, just in terms of money and status slash power. And we ignore kind of the third leg of the stool, which is uh, our well-being and health, our wisdom, our capacity to tap into our wonder about life and giving. So these four pillars need to be part of an integrated good life. And when we ignore them, something is missing. And now people are willing to look at that. We have people who are leaving um, big salaries to go follow their passion to be teachers or do things that contribute to the community but don't have the same career trajectory. You said something profound, and I want to repeat it. Uh, I've been privileged to be the guest on four or five podcasts in the last week as an author myself. And on each podcast, I have quoted you, but I have said, in the last week, it was Ariana Huffington who renamed the Great Resignation, the Great Reevaluation. And since then, it's been renamed 50 Things. I think you actually started the recontextualization of this with your team's renaming of it a couple of weeks ago. This should not be lost on everyone. It is, in fact, the great reevaluation. Whether you've lost a parent or a sibling or a spouse or a child or a neighbor to the pandemic, whether someone lost their job or their business or their livelihood or their marriage, we're all reassessing our values, are we not? I think it's a global comeuppance, if you will. I'm guessing that in your renaming the great resignation, the great reevaluation, that isn't just a professional assessment, it's a whole life assessment. Pour into us right now what you think we need to know about our values and our purpose, our lives post pandemic. Well, I think we need to see this as the silver lining of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, without in any way um, minimizing the losses and the pain, um, we need to also see the pandemic as a catalyst for fundamental changes that, frankly, had to be made pre-pandemic, but change is hard. And that's why, as a Stanford economist put it, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So let's not waste this crisis. Let's not continue to live our lives in the breathless, self-destructive ways so many of us have been living our lives until we collapsed, in many cases, much worse than, than what happened to me. And that's at the heart of what we are bringing to companies around the world that thrive, is the recognition that there is a real connection between the well-being of employees and the performance of employees and business metrics. You know, that's a fundamental mind shift um, that we are much closer to achieving because of the pandemic. And, you know, frankly, Scott, it goes back to the first industrial revolution when we suddenly started to look at human beings like machines. And what's the goal of machines and after machine software? It's to minimize downtime. But for the human operating system, downtime is a feature, not a bug. And we all need it if we're going to be our most creative and most productive selves. And now we see these conversations happening at a higher and higher levels in companies because people see the alternative. Let's stay in this topic for a moment. I think one of your hallmarks is your insatiable curiosity. It is how you've been able to continuously rebrand yourself and be relevant, perhaps even uber relevant, of ahead of societal change. Uh, take out your Nostradamus crystal ball for a moment, recognizing that you're not a trend forecaster by, you know, by, by uh, intention. Where do you think the puck is going to land in terms of organizational culture, you know, for the last couple of decades, century, the power, if you will, was, you know, from the employer and at the top and, 
and it seems to have, the pendulum seems to have, you know, swung a bit now where it's uh, employees market, so to speak. When it all shakes out, where do you think the professional landscape is going to land in terms of what it looks like in the gig economy and Web3 and that kind of stuff? Where do you think leaders listening and watching you today should be thinking about putting their energy and their time and their investments for the growth of their organization? Oh, Scott, that's such a great question. And I can unequivocally answer that the employee experience is going to be the key. In fact, uh, um, it's been estimated to be a $7 trillion business. Uh, It's a huge shift from where the world has been. I just finished reading a book. It's not out yet. It's a wonderful book by David Gellis on Jack Welch and the impact he had on capitalism. And for many decades, uh, employees were seen as disposable. And uh, the paramount uh, responsibility of companies was seen to be to the shareholders. Gradually, we began to see that there are multiple other stakeholders. And now the employees are at the center. And we are seeing that they are exercising their power, often by walking out, um, but also that the that employers prioritization of the mental health and resilience of employees is making that shift where the connection is finally clear between the state of well-being, health, resilience of employees and the performance, sustainable performance of companies. You know, I was on the board of Uber and definitely you can have great results for a time. Uh, in a culture fueled by burnout, but not sustainably. And that's really what is changing, and that's why I'm optimistic um, about where we are going. As always, Scott, you know, there are companies that are ahead of others, uh, but at least in language, you see how the language of prioritizing the employee experience is now pretty universal, suddenly. And... uh, Facts are always lagging a little behind, uh, but the fact that the language has changed is key. Well, speaking of language, I think it's a great word choice to be thinking about what is our employee experience. I don't think it's a term that most organizations use to describe the journey that their colleagues have inside the company. It's a great question to ask each other. What is our employee experience? Ariana, your most recent book was focused on sleep. Would you talk a few minutes about the fascinating research between sleep deprivation and false memories? This is an interesting tidbit that I think all of us can benefit from. Well, first of all, what we've seen again through the pandemic is how paramount sleep is to our immunity as well as as to our cognition. So um, false memories is part of cognition. But I think it's a much, much larger uh, question, Scott, because we've seen with real data now that when we are sleep deprived, uh, we are much more likely to get sick. There is a connection between COVID immunity um, as well as every other disease and sleep deprivation. And when it comes to cognition, there is even um, connection between sleep deprivation and dementia, Alzheimer's. So sleep, which used to be um, often held in contempt in our culture, you know, John Bon Jovi sang, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And um, a lot of people are now bragging about how much sleep they get. On our app, we have six journeys of what it takes to really live a, um, a fully healthy life. And the first one is sleep. The second is food movement, uh, connection, focus, money, all these are uh, key elements of a whole human um, prioritization of of how we live our daily lives, but it starts with sleep. And uh, 
we also know that everything else is affected when we are sleep deprived. We crave bad um, foods and carbs and sugars physiologically. So that's what I love about all the modern science that has connected all these different aspects um, of our daily lives. Uh, Ariana, to that point, in many ways, you have brought the full force of your life's work, your influence, your brand, your credibility to bring about a revolution, a conversation, a change, as you called it, in our behavior to recognize the, the unmistakable importance, not just of our mental health, but of our physical health, as practical as our sleep. You know, for decades, I think there has been perhaps an unconscious disservice done by these high-performing CEOs that talk about and model how little, much, how little sleep they need. And I think unintentionally, or maybe intentionally, they shamed a lot of their organizations as perhaps being lazy or not valuable enough if they were actually sleeping a seven or eight hour night, when we know, of course, all the research, all the science shows how important sleep is. Will you put like a pin in that and just wake everyone up who's watching and listening right now and make sure all of us leave reconnected to the unmistakable value that is the role sleep plays in our lives? Well, there, there is now an incredible body of um, <clears throat> scientific research that uh, makes it clear that unless you have a genetic mutation, and people who have a genetic mutation, about one and a half percent of the population, <clears throat> don't need a lot of sleep. But the vast majority of us need seven to nine hours um, to be fully recharged and be fully productive and creative and also joyful. Um, we all can tell from ourselves that when we are exhausted and sleep deprived, we are the worst version of ourselves. You know, more reactive, less empathetic, less creative. And these are very much um, qualities that we need more than ever to navigate uncertain times. We launched um, an amazing mental health curriculum with Stanford called Thriving Mind that helps people identify their own stress types, their own biotypes that uh, can lead them to depression and anxiety if they don't address them. And we've seen how critical sleep is in uh, how much more likely we are to be depressed or anxious depending on what challenges yeah. the world is throwing yeah. our way. It would be interesting to know if any research has been conducted on that one and a half percent of you know, uh, genetic mutation and are they the people in the C-suite in the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s that are reinforcing that? Uh, let's, pivot. <laughs> let's pivot for a moment. Let's talk about leadership. Um, have there been any crossroads in your own leadership journey that you look back on and say, wow, that was a lesson that at the time I didn't fully understand, but wow, now I really understand it one, two, 10, 20 years later? Well, definitely my buying into the collective delusion that I had to be always on to be successful um, is something that was such a big mistake in my life and and I only realized it after my own collapse and part of my um, reasoning behind founding uh, Thrive is that I want people to realize that they can be incredibly more productive and creative and happy and healthy without sacrificing uh, their own well-being and without buying into the collective delusion that burnout is the price we pay for success. You know, Scott, when we launched Thrive in 2016, our mission statement was to end the stress and burnout epidemic. In 2016, people were not talking about burnout. It wasn't until 2019 that the World Health Organization acknowledged it as an occupational hazard. Now, you can hardly talk to any company, and I talk to dozens of them, that does not identify burnout as a company-wide problem. Yeah. Feeding uh, attrition, feeding lack of productivity, and um, weaker business results. 
To keep on the topic of leadership, has there ever been a time in your role as the CEO or co-founder entrepreneur where you were responsible for payroll and development and reinvention and making bold choices where you knew you had to make an unpopular choice? You really felt it was the right choice, but it was unpopular to perhaps your funders or your board or your senior leadership team, and you knew it was the right thing. How did you deal with that and communicate to people confidence and trust to follow you on where you felt the business needed to go? Actually, it was a choice um, I made um three years into building Thrive Global, but I did have um, the full support of my board. Um, and that was to pivot from um, indirect um, product, products, mm. uh, media products, um, to a pure SaaS enterprise technology product. You know, it meant really giving up tens of millions of dollars of companies that we're working with uh, to work on the media around the well-being and health priorities of companies in order to focus on ARR product um, revenue uh, that was all based on our technology and our behavior change science. Um, I was a big believer in that. I thought that was the way to scale uh, because without a product, it's very hard to scale. Everything had to be customized. But it was a tough decision because it meant giving up a lot of revenue. And um, I was very lucky to have an amazing board uh, with the leadership of Samesh Dash at IVP who had led our Series B that was completely with me. And um, I feel for entrepreneurs, it's really lucky when you have investors uh, who see where we are going. And of course, it paid off when we got a, a very large multiple for our Series C. Ariana, you've called me by name five times in this interview. I have taped close to 225 interviews with some of the biggest luminaries in the world. And something that I watch for is when a guest calls me by name. You've used my name five times. John Maxwell, Matthew McConaughey, General McChrystal, and about two others have used my name during the interview. This is not by mistake. And my sense is from what I know about you and our company has had some conversations with you about some areas of alliance. My sense is it's very genuine. Talk to why using someone's name is important. Well, I feel that you and I are having a conversation, even though there are a lot of people listening and even though we are not in the same space. I feel connected with you. I'm a big believer in prep, Scott. I've done all my research on you. I have pictures of you and your family. I love the way you do your bio and cross out one word or another word and replace it with another. So I believe that when I'm prepared, when I feel I have made a connection with you, even before we do the interview, this is going to be deeper and we can go further than if I was just um, responding um, without a clear connection with who I'm conversing with. And also that makes it so much more fun for me uh, I like to be very present in everything I'm doing, not just to check another box. And you can't do that without intimacy and personal connection. That's why actually one of my favorite um, features in the Thrive product is called Reset. It's based on the science that it takes 60 to 90 seconds to course correct from stress. And uh, so each uh, Thrive employee, for example, or the employee of any company you work with, creates their own reset of things that they love in their life. So mine has pictures of my children, uh, favorite quotes, music, landscapes. And if we were having a conversation again, I would love to play it at the beginning and have you play yours if you had created one. 
because immediately it brings us closer together. So I love the fact that in 60 seconds, we can bring more intimacy into conversation. So at, at Thrive, we start every team meeting spinning the wheel and one of us shares the reset. So I think increasingly, as we are moving into a more and more hybrid world, where a lot more is going to be happening uh, with people not being in the same physical space, it's going to be more and more important to create these rituals of intimacy and connection. Thank you for that. If Ariana Huffington has time to research her podcast hosts, we all have time to invest a little more and to getting to know our colleagues and our neighbors and the members of our communities. Ariana, last question for you. Uh, and take a moment before you answer. Precisely, when was the first time that you knew you were a leader? Well, first of all, um, I must say, Scott, that I, I've definitely suffered from imposter syndrome for a lot of my life. I, I um, have been for many years hearing that voice in my head that I call the obnoxious roommate, uh, putting me down, um, pointing out my mistakes again and again and again. Uh, in the Thriving Mind Stanford curriculum, we have, I'm a ruminator. So um, it, it wasn't easy for me um, to recognize my strengths until quite late in life. I, I, I became a mother late in life. I was um, 38 when I had my first child and 40 when I had my second. And ironically, it was having children that uh, made me uh, find more uh, confidence in myself and, and um, greater willingness uh, to take risks and not to beat myself up over every mistake. So it's kind of ironic and paradoxical that something that was very personal and, um, and, and just an amazing experience uh, put everything else in perspective and, and made me um, feel much more uh, comfortable in my own strengths rather than constantly focusing on my weaknesses. Ariana Huffington, you have a lot of things going on in your world. How gracious and abundant that you would take the time to talk with us and invest in all of our listeners and viewers around the world. Tell us, uh, what's next for you? So I'm like 100% focused on growing Thrive um, with customers around the world. And I'm particularly excited, Scott, to reach not just knowledge workers, but um, frontline workers. Um, one of our big customers is Walmart. They have 2.2 million associates, as they call them. Most of them work in stores. And we've done incredible work with them since March 2020 and seen amazing results in people adopting healthier habits through these micro steps that we have in our app. And some of them reversing diabetes and, and hypertension without medical um, advice, just by changing the way they eat and sleep and move. And that makes me very optimistic about the future and I'm personally particularly um, focused on uh, making a difference in the lives of those who are facing the greatest challenges. And indeed you are. As you know, our founder, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, now has passed over a decade ago. He would be giddy if he was sitting in our studio today listening to you. Ariana, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Best of success to you and all your endeavors. Thank you so much, Scott. Great to be with you. Don't know how we will top this interview, but we will see you back here next week for a new guest on leadership. <laughs>